and reveal to people. And Father, we thank you that we won't leave here the way that we came in. We thank you for transformation. Father, we enter ourselves into agreement with so many people who prayed and came here believing for a miracle. And Father, we believe that your power is flowing in this place to set us free. So Father, we just open up our hearts right now. I know that many of you came from all different walks of life. You've got all kinds of things. You may have had problems getting here, but right now you just need to set everything aside and allow the Holy Spirit to touch you and to do what He brought you here for. It's bigger than what you think. Father, we welcome this, and we believe that you are opening up people's hearts. Father, we believe that any hardened hearts, any people that have lost hope, Father, we believe that your power is flowing in here. We just agree right now and release the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit to melt and to break through people's hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we agree and we receive this in the name of Jesus. Man, I just want to serve notice on the devil that it's, you, it's going to be hard for him to stay in your life during these next couple of days. Man, we believe that bondages are being broken and that the anointing of God is going to set people free. I believe that even as you come on this campus, that man, the anointing of God is going to be touching people, that people are going to be healed. If you need healing in your body, I believe we're going to see great miracles happen. I tell you, I just have an expectancy on the inside of me that, that, that people that didn't even come expecting anything are going to get something. I don't know how this is going to work. But I'm telling you, God is going to break through some hard hearts. Some of you that thought that, man, you've gone too far and you came here not expecting anything. You came here to pacify your wife or to pacify somebody else who brought you. I tell you, there, there's going to be some breakthroughs. I just want to speak hope into your heart. Lord is speaking to me that some of you came here really just thinking that, man, it's, it, we're too far gone. You didn't expect anything. You need to get your hopes up. Some of you have been hurt so many times you're afraid to get your hopes up, but you need to. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith gives substance to what's hoped for. The very first step, some of you are saying, I can't believe God. Man, things are too bad. I can't believe that something's going to happen. Well, just start hoping. Amen. Get your hopes up and then faith will kick in once you get your hopes up. But you've got to start, you've got to open up your heart. And I believe that this isn't just for a few people. I believe that this is for a lot of people here that you came here and man, you need to be stirred up and we are going to see that happen. You know, I said this last year and I know we've got a lot of new people here, but anyway, it bears repeating that, you know, you are a winner from the moment of conception. You had a million brothers and sisters fighting for your mother's egg, and you won. Amen. You won from the moment of conception. God created you to be an overcomer. And you know, the sad thing is most people get that, that attitude beat out of them. We had a man that came up right here. He was at one of our services. He's the one that runs the Colorado Springs Christian School, and they have a branch of that here in Woodland Park. And we were here during a praise and worship service and we were talking about believing God for big things, taking the limits off of God. And I remember Roland came up on stage to make a promotion for the Colorado Springs Christian School. But before he did it, he made this point. He says that, you know, he has from uh, preschool, I think, through uh, 12th grade or high school. And he said that when he asked the first year uh, the first grade students, how many of you are artists? And he said, every single one of them raised their hand that they were an artist. And he said, he saw some of their artwork and uh, it wasn't very good, but every one of them believed that they were an artist. But by the time they got to 12th grade, he said, how many of you are artists? And I mean, it was just a few people. 
Now it is true that some people are gifted and talented more, but see that illustrates that you start off young and you just believe that, man, you can do anything. But then life comes along and we fail in things. You know, lots of, we're going to be talking about sports. We've got Tony and JB here, and I know that they're going to be using a lot of sports illustrations. And there are some people that excel at sports, but there's others that don't. And because of it, you begin to think you just aren't up to the par of other people. And then other things happen, and men, we make all kinds of mistakes. I just read a book about a woman who was raised in a dysfunctional home and was told she was a loser from the word go and things, and it just shaped her whole life. She became an alcoholic, a drug addict, and uh, cut herself and self-harm, and just terrible things happened. And the thing that turned her life around was somebody just speaking into her life and saying that you're a winner, that God intended for you to win, that this is nothing but the devil that's fighting against you. And anyway, my point is that we all start off optimistic, but things happen and it takes that hope away from people. But I'm telling you, hope is a powerful force. And I'm just feeling in my heart right now that there are people here that have let this hope go. And you may feel justified. You may think, but you don't know what's happened to me. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what's happened to you. Jesus is greater than anything that has happened to you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. If God ever had a purpose for your life, God still has a purpose for your life. He doesn't change. It's without repentance. And, you know, God is at least as good as a GPS system. You make a wrong turn and that thing will say recalculating. And it doesn't matter how far off track you get. That thing has a way to get you back on track. God has a way to restore every single person's life. Some of you have been through multiple marriages. You've been through bankruptcy. You've been through failure. You've been through uh, physical things. But God has a way to get you back on track. I've got a lot of things I'm wanting to say, but I just feel like, man, God is trying to get me, uh, some of you stirred up. You came here expecting nothing. You're aiming at nothing and you're going to hit it <laughs> unless I can get you to start believing that God has a purpose for your life. Look over here in Jeremiah chapter one. Let me share with you something that God spoke directly to me. Now, of course, in the scripture here, God spoke this to Jeremiah. But I can show you the place. January of 1973, the Kingsley Place Apartments in Dallas, Texas. I was going to bed. And man, back in those days, I could hit the pillow and be asleep before, you know, I even got comfortable. I mean, I just fell asleep. But I went to bed and I could not go to sleep. And we just had a one-bedroom apartment I didn't want to keep Jamie awake, so I, I went into the uh, living room and our, our little living room that we had, and I mean, God showed up. And I don't know, but for hours, I was just on my face in front of God, and I was afraid to open my eyes because I wasn't sure what would happen. And a lot of things happened. I hadn't got time to go through all of it, but God spoke this to me. It was spoken to Jeremiah, but he spoke it to me. And, and the point is that God's no respecter of persons. If God spoke this to Jeremiah, if he spoke it to me, he, he can speak it to you. And look at this in Jeremiah chapter 1. And in verse 4, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Boy, there's a lot in this verse. Let me just point out a couple of things. He says, before I even formed you in the belly, before you came forth out of your mother's womb, I knew you and he already had a plan for Jeremiah. He had already ordained him. Brothers, I want to tell you that some of you think you're looking back at your life and you're looking at some of the things that have happened and the failures and the hardships and you're saying, how could God use me? God chose you and had a purpose for your life before you were ever born. What has happened to you has nothing to do with God's opinion of what He wants to do with you. You may be looking at it and thinking, well, but how could He use this? God doesn't see you the way you see yourself. You know, over in Psalms 139, keep your finger here, I'm not through. Man, I've got so many things I'm wanting to share, it's hard for me to get this out. 
Psalms 139, real quickly, let me just share this with you. In beginning in verse 14. One thirty nine verse fourteen I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul no soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance as being unperfect, and in thy book all of my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. You know that 16th verse, it's real wordy in the King James, but in the NIV. Does anybody have the NIV here? One person way back there. <laughs> A couple things. Anyway, I won't take... Have you got it up here? Oh, awesome. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Man, that is powerful. Again, most people think that God, you know, he needs somebody to do something, somebody to preach or something. And so God looks around and he sees somebody over here that can speak or he needs, he sees somebody like Dave that can play the guitar and sing. And so God looks and says, oh, I could use them. But that's not the way God is. God wrote in a book everything that he wanted you to accomplish before you were even born. It had nothing to do with your performance. It had nothing to do with your ability. And did you know, I've already quoted that verse, Romans chapter 11, verse 29, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. Whatever God planned for your life before you were ever born, it still stands with God. God doesn't change. Now, you, He doesn't force His plan upon you. There are some people that teach we're like a pawn and God just moves us around and we have no choice in the matter, but that is absolutely wrong. God does not force you, but he has a plan for you before you were ever born, before you were ever conceived. God had already written in a book what your life is about. You know, if you understood what I'm saying right here, this would radically, radically change our lives. Because the average person basically goes through life just kind of letting things uh, control them, going with the flow. It's kind of like being in an inner tube and floating down the stream and just wherever it takes you, that's how you go. I'm telling you, a dead fish can float downstream. That's not the way you're supposed to live your life. Some of you, some of you are doing jobs. And again, I'm not, you know, let me just apologize in, in advance. That I want to edify you and I want to help you. And this is really going to help you. But sometimes you got to get terrified before you get edified. Amen. <laughs> sometimes you got to find out what's wrong and spell it out before you can get the, you know, the uh, prescription to get you well. And it's important that you understand that most people go through life just letting, well, your parents chose this. You know, I know that when the Lord touched my life, I was going in my first year of college and I didn't have a clue what I was going to do. I had no direction whatsoever. There was nothing driving me. I was just letting life push me along. And every person in my family, my father, my mother, my brother, my sister, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, aunts, and all but one uncle were teachers, school teachers. And so I was going to become a school teacher just because that's what we did in our family. I was just being pushed along with the flow. And I know that there's people right here that, you know, you inherited the family business or, you know, you just did something, something happened and you're going through life. But that is not the way to discern God's will for you. You don't let circumstances do this. It, a lot of people, you're like a pinball machine. You take that ball and you pull back the lever and you launch it and you just bounce off of this and bounce off of that. And whatever happens to you, it just gives you the direction for your life. But God, I can guarantee you, when God shows you His will for your life, you are going to have to pursue it. It does not happen automatically. You can't float downstream and run into God's will. God has a plan for you, but you have to pursue it. You have to seek it. And again, the vast majority of people, I, I think you guys are awesome to come out here to a man's advance, come from different countries and things. I, 
I commend you, but I'm saying that I would be shocked if the majority of people sitting right here knew for sure that God, uh, what God's plan for your life was. And I base this on what I've dealt with people for 50 years now. Just the majority of people are kind of just going through life and letting life direct them. And then, as I was saying, you have these negative experiences and you begin to think, how could God use this? Before you were ever born, before you were formed in your mother's womb, before you came out of the belly, you were ordained by God. God had a purpose for your life. And look at Jeremiah when the Lord spoke this to him. It says in the next verse, in verse um, 6, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And you know, this is the reaction that most people have. I remember the night that the Lord spoke this to me. Like I said, the Lord had been in my room for a couple of hours, and I just was flat on my face for hours. I was afraid to open my eyes, afraid I'd, what I'd see. And then the Lord spoke this to me. And when he said this, God, I can't do it. I was an introvert. I couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. And this was the furthest thing. You know, most people, when they're trying to find out what God wants you to do, you look at your gifts and talents and abilities and try and pick and choose and say, what could this be used for? But I don't think most of us have ever discovered our real talents and abilities. God is going to call you to do something that is different than what your natural self is. Let me say it this way, that if, you, if what you're doing can be accomplished in your own strength and power, then you've missed God. God is going to call you to do something that causes you to go beyond yourself, that is bigger than you. Like with me, I couldn't look at a person, I couldn't talk to him, I was an extreme introvert, and God calls me to talk to millions of people. God is going to call you to do something that is going to draw you out of yourself and make you say, oh God, I need your help. And so most people see, evaluate, God, I've got this talent. How could I use this? You need a word from God. God gave you gifts and talents. And I think that the majority of people have never fully discovered what God has called you to do. I heard a man, I think it was Miles Monroe, say that if you want to find the place on the earth that has the most potential, go to a graveyard. Because most people took it to the grave. Most of us are playing it easy. We're just taking what is the easiest, the simple, what's the safest route? Something that is, you know, not a challenge, no failure, fear of failure. But God is going to call you to do something that is way bigger than you. Way bigger than you. You know, when we started building this campus, it was in 2009 that the Lord spoke to me. We were down in Colorado Springs and said we needed to do something with the school. And I was, I was honestly considering limiting the enrollment. I was considering breaking the three years into three separate parts and renting small places so that we wouldn't have to go to any expense. Uh, I considered just all kinds of things. And... As I prayed about it, it was the beginning of the quote-unquote great recession. Things were so bad, people were committing suicide. And during the great recession, God told me that, man, I was thinking way too small, and I started dreaming big, and we bought this place and began. We've done in the last five and a half years, six, nearly six years now, we've done over $73 million worth of building and everything debt free. And you know what? When we started it, I had nothing. And you know what? I've still got nothing. We were just talking today about things. And I've, we're committed to moving into this building before the school year starts. I've already invited people for the dedication November the 3rd. But at the rate we're spending money, it'll be 2019 before we get through. So I don't have the money to do this. I've never had the money to do anything I've ever done. <laughs> I'm telling you, God is going to ask you to do something that pulls you beyond yourself. And yet most people, they just look at what they can do and they limit God. Uh, Jeremiah said, God, I can't speak. And look at what the Lord said to him. The Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. 
Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. And the Lord went on and spoke to me. Actually, the Lord kept speaking to me all the way over here to chapter 5 and verse 14. And this was another thing he spoke to me that same night. And it says, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and the people would, and it shall devour them. And so this night... God told me, don't ever say you're a child. And you know what? There's been a million times that I said, God, I'm not up to it, but I've learned to keep my mouth shut and not to say it. And I really, God touched my mouth that night. You know, prior to that time, I had taught Bible studies. I'd taught Sunday school classes because I felt like God had called me to the ministry, but I was so petrified that it was just terrible. It was like, pulling teeth. I hated it. And yet I couldn't do anything else. I felt like it's what God had for me. And, uh, the very first meeting I ever held, it was a three day meeting. I went and bought a book and I memorized three messages for this three day meeting. And I got so nervous. I preached all three of them in the first five minutes of the first <laughs> service. And if you thought that first night was bad, the second and third night were worse because I didn't have time to memorize anything. It was pitiful. And it was so bad that every time I'd get up to minister, I'd, I'd ask God to forgive me and say, I'll never embarrass you or me again. I'll never do this again. But it's like Jeremiah 5, uh, 29 says, it was like fire shut up in my bones. I couldn't forbear. I had to speak and I'd go try it again. But for two years I'd been trying and, and nothing would work. And after this night, God told me, don't you ever say you're a child again. You will speak. And then he touched me and put his words in my mouth. And right after this, I had agreed to a layman Sunday thing where I was supposed to get up and speak for 30 minutes. And I was regretting that I had done it. But after the Lord touched me, I got up and I spoke for two hours. They actually came up and pulled me off the <laughs> stage and made me sit down and shut up because, man, I went till one o'clock or one thirty or something like that. And I mean, God set me free. So my point is, God is going to call you to do something that is based on what his plan for you is, what he wrote in your book for you long before you were ever born long before you had ever done anything. It's not based on your talents as you see them right now. Amen. You know, I've taken these personality tests. I don't know how many of you have ever taken one of those. But I, I, I don't believe that they're totally bad because I've taken two or three of them. And I mean, it's scary how accurate they are. I had a woman give me one of those and she had never seen me, didn't know anything about me. And after she I answered all of these questions. She started telling me things and I thought, this woman's followed me around. This woman knows me. But the thing I disagree with them about, all it can do is take a picture of where you are at that moment. It can't tell you what your true potential is. It couldn't tell you what things would be like if you let the Lord set you free and let the Lord start working in your life. And a lot of people will see those things and they will put limits on themselves and say, well, I could never do this because that's not my personality type. Man, I totally disagree with that. I'm telling you, God gave you talents and abilities. The color of your skin, where you were born, all kinds of things that you had zero control over. God did this. He had it written out before you were ever born. And many of us have just limited God. We look at things and we look at our natural talents and abilities and and we limit what God can do. But I am telling you that God has a purpose for your life. God's never made a piece of junk. God has never made a failure. God has never created anybody to have all of the problems that so many people have today. And a lot of it comes just because we aren't recognizing what God created you for. You have to start with finding out your purpose for existence. And I'm telling you, just as I said earlier, God created you a winner from the moment you were conceived. 
God has a plan for you to succeed. I don't care what has gone on in your life. God can plot a course from where you are to where He wants you to be. But you know what? He will not force it on you. You have to cooperate. You have to pursue the things of God. And this is where so many people miss it. They let life just beat all of this hope, all of this, um, you know, confidence that they could do something out of them and they are just marching through life struggling. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but you answer this in your heart. If you're one of those that get up and go to work on Monday and you talk about Blue Monday and you just drag yourself in, you hate your job and you just do it because, you know, getting a paycheck is better than the alternative. You do what you have to do. But then on Friday, man, TGIF and you are all excited and you can't wait to get home and stuff. You've missed God's will for your life. I really believe that. You know, Paul and I just got through with a, a vacation and I enjoyed it. I spent 10 days down in Cancun and it was nice. But you know what? I was so excited to get back. When I got into class on Tuesday and started teaching, I told the students, I said, man, I love this. I love being here. I hate being gone. I don't know why I ever go anywhere else. I just love what God has called me to do. And I enjoyed the vacation and I needed it. I'm not saying that you don't take breaks, but I'm saying you ought to be enthused. You ought to be pumped up about what you're doing. If you have to drag yourself to work, if you're having to force yourself to go through things, you have not found God's will. Or if you found it, you let the devil take you out of faith. You aren't recognizing where you are. But I'm saying it ought to be energizing to you when you're in the center of God's will. Man, you ought to be excited. And I just know in my heart that there's a lot of men right here that that is not the case with you. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you that God has an awesome plan for your life, a better plan for your life than what your plans are. And yet again, many of us limit. We look at our own natural abilities and we allow life to just beat us down. You know, I was just teaching recently on this, but uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when David stood up and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? His own brother, Eliab, was the very first one to say, what are you doing? Who have you left these few sheep with? And, and they began to criticize him. Jesus said this exact same thing, that a prophet is not without honor except in his own house and in his own country and among his own kin. Did you know that when you start trying to say, God's got a purpose for my life, I'm going to succeed. I'm going I'm to prevail. I'm going to overcome things. The people around you and sometimes your own family will be the very ones to start criticizing you and putting you down. And there's multiple reasons for it. But you know, one of them is that if you succeed and you're from the same gene pool and you're from the same environment and if you succeed, then it makes them look bad. And so they've got to draw you down. They've got to bring you down to their level because uh, if, if God could use you, he could have used them. It's a lot easier to pull you down than it is for them to come up to your level. And so really, if you understand it that way, persecution is a compliment. If you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps aloud, the loudest got hit. And the people who persecute you the most are the people who are under pressure. And so what they're going to do is try and discredit you so that they can discredit the message and get out from under the conviction. But I'm telling you, there's some of you that you know God has something more, but people around you are just constantly drawing you down and telling you to settle for less, just take it easy. I tell you, we're playing it way too safe. You know, I spend millions of dollars. We got Doug Nees here. He's my media buyer. He could tell you. We spend, I forget, but it's over a million dollars a month on television and radio and... Um, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of things and we're reaching a lot of people, but every one of you here have people under your influence that'll never hear of me, that I'll never reach. And if I spent 10 times as much money as I've got, I'll never reach the people that you reach. And if you don't reach your potential, if you don't start thinking bigger, if you don't let God inspire you and show you something 
then there's all kinds of people that are going to fall through the cracks. You're the one that has their miracle. You're the one that God wrote in his book that you were supposed to touch those people that you work with, the neighbors that you live next to, your family members. You're the one that it's written down that you're supposed to reach them. I can't reach them. And if you don't reach your full potential, there's going to be people that'll die and go to hell. There'll be people who'll stay sick. There'll be all kinds of things that'll happen if you don't reach your potential. Brothers, every one of you in here is important. One of the big mistakes we've made in the body of Christ is to put certain people in the clergy and they're the ones that God is going to use and all we do is just warm a pew and wait on them to do everything. You know, I don't know how many people we have here, but it's well over 1,000, 12, 1,300 or whatever. And you know, if every person in here was to get fired up this week and to start believing God and start walking with God and let God flow through you and give you creative ideas... And if you started living up to your full potential and doing those things that were written in God's book before you were ever born, I guarantee you, I believe that this could change the entire nation. There's lots of people that you influence. If we all went back to our sphere of influence and we're living this, it would make a radical difference. And again, some of you are thinking, oh, no, I don't have that kind of influence. You would if you were walking in the supernatural power of God. You know, Jesus said, if you're believing on him, the works that he did, will you do also and even greater works than these. And this isn't talking to just preachers. It says, if you are believers, if you believe on him, I guarantee you, if every one of you went out of here and raised somebody from the dead, we'd have all the revival we could handle. But what we do is we're spending our time praying and saying, oh, God, move. Oh, God, do something. And God's praying that you'll move. Amen. He's praying that you will find out your potential, that you'll begin to start living up to it. And again, brothers, you could touch people that I'll never touch, that these other pastors here will never touch. It is just imperative that you begin to live up to what God called you to do. And I know some of you are thinking, man, this is just putting condemnation on me and showing me that I'm a a loser. I haven't done what God wants me to do. That's not my intent. But I'm saying that you're never going to change as long as you are satisfied where you are. You've got to have a holy dissatisfaction. You've got to get to a place where I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And brothers, you can do this. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm proof of that. Man, if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. And yet God is just blessing me and using me and people's lives are being changed. I had probably a dozen people as I walked through here tonight tell me about how that their life was totally changed and things have happened. And if God can use me, he can use anybody. Matter of fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and following, it says, you see your calling, brother, and it's not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise men after the flesh, but God has chosen the weak things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are nothing to bring to naught, things that are. And it says the reason he does it that way is so that no flesh would glory in his presence. God delights in using people that in the natural can't do it so that when God flows through them, people say, this has got to be God. It can't be that person. So if you feel like you are unqualified, if you feel like you're base, despise nothing, you qualify. Amen. The only people God can't use are the people that aren't dependent upon God, the people that think that they can do it on their own. Man, if you feel like, how could God use me? I'm a child. How could I speak? You're the very person that God wants to use. I'm telling you, God can energize you. God can do supernatural things through you. There's not a person in here. I don't care what's going on in your life. That God couldn't change you. That God couldn't energize you. But it's not going to happen with you just floating downstream. It's not going to happen with you just going through life and letting circumstances control your life. You are going to have to take control. You are going to have to start seeking God. And you know, the very fact that you're here 
means that man, you are seeking God or either somebody who is seeking God drug you here. One of the two. But you aren't the nod to God crowd. You are here looking for something more. And you just need to do this not on in spurts. You know, the scripture says the just shall live by faith. You don't need to visit there, vacation there. Just go to a man's advance one time a year. You need to live by faith. This needs to be the way that you are constantly seeking God. And I promise you, when you do that, it says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The NIV says a hope and a future. That verse is confirming everything I'm saying. God ha has good thoughts towards you, thoughts of peace. God never created a single person to fail. That is not what he wrote in your book. That is not written down. That is not God's plan for a single person. His thoughts are peace towards you to give you an expected end. I like the NIV when it says a hope and a future, but I, I like the King James. Because, you know, when it says you have an expected end, that means that I know what my end's going to be like because I've been seeking God, and He said He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, and so I know that I'm going to win. I can expect that. I don't have to just do the best I can and hope that it works out. Man, I have an expected end. I'm not going to go out with a whimper. I'm going to go out with a shout. Yeah. I'm going to say with the Apostle Paul, I've run the race. I've finished my course, and I know that there is a reward for me. I'm expecting that. And then right after that, in verse 12, it says, And you shall seek me. This is verse 13, I think. You shall seek me, and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. All of your heart. There are people that will seek the Lord in spurts. And if your back's up against the wall and you know that you can't pull this thing out on your own, you'll ask God to help you temporarily. But God looks on the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 17. God looks on the heart. He knows whether you are, you know, giving it everything you've got or not. But when you seek with all of your heart, you'll find him. I've had people tell me, well, I asked and nothing happened. Well, God is waiting on you to seek with all of your heart. Here's another way of saying it. As long as you can live without knowing God's perfect will and without you fulfilling God's perfect will, you will. But when you reach that place to where I've had it, I'm not living this way anymore. God will come through. But you have to seek with all of your heart. You know, Moses was seeking the Lord and he says, Oh God, show me your glory. And God says, I will be with you and I will go with you. And Moses, this is Exodus chapter 33, I believe. And Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with me, I'm not moving. That's where we need to get to be. God, I'm not going to go through life. I'm not just going to do what everybody else is doing. I'm driving a stake right here and I'm not moving until I know what your will is. And you know, the good thing is, it says in Ephesians chapter 5 that be not ignorant, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's a command. Right after it's talking about don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It says, don't be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The Lord wouldn't have given us that command if He didn't want to reveal His will to us. God wants you to know what His purpose for your life is more than you want to know it. But it doesn't get revealed to us with, when you're passive, when you're weak. You've got to become aggressive. You've got to get to where you pursue the things of God. I can guarantee you this, brothers, that it's not God who has failed a single person in here. God is faithful. But it says there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. The only reason that we aren't all experiencing God's best in our life is not because God doesn't have a plan and not because God isn't faithful. It's because we have done it our way. Us and Frank Sinatra. We did it our way. Let me ask you, how's that working? I can guarantee you, brothers, that any problem that we've got in our life, it's because you did it your way. 
And I know that there's some people saying, no, that's not true. I mean, I've got sickness in my body and I didn't have a thing to do. I didn't cause sickness. Man, I hope you'll track with me right here. Some people don't, can't connect these dots. But it's true. That you know what? You may not have thought, all right, I want to have cancer. All right, I want to have this sickness. I want to have poverty. I want to have this. You may not have asked for it. You may not have gone out and have planned on it. But you were thinking like a mere human being, thinking I'm only human and thinking that cancer is incurable and, well, it's flu season and so, it, you know, it, you just got to get sick. That's wrong. It's wrong thinking. You may not have thought ways that, it, that brought it because you asked for it, but when it came, because we live in a fallen world, you were thinking in a way that limited what God could do. You accepted the sickness. You accepted poverty. You accepted these things. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Man, that, that didn't say that carnal mindedness produces death for some people, sometimes. No, it's just, it's an equation. Carnal mindedness equals death. Spiritual mindedness equals life and peace. And so based on that scripture, I can say that if you are experiencing death, any form of death, this doesn't have to be ultimate death where you quit breathing and we go to be with the Lord. But you know, depression is death. Anything that came as a result of sin is death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Anything that came as a result of sin, poverty, depression, sickness, sorrow, grief, bitterness, unforgiveness, uh, anything you want to mention, if you are experiencing any form of death, it's because you were carnally minded. Again, that doesn't mean that necessarily you're a terrible person, but you're just thinking like a natural, normal person person. You aren't just natural. If you are born again, you are a brand new person on the inside. You are now have the spirit of God living on the inside of you. If you don't have Jesus living in you, we're going to give you an opportunity to fix that tonight. Amen. But if you are born again and have the spirit of God on the inside of you, well, then you are a world overcomer. And you should be able to see this power manifest. It's already there, but you've got to think that way. And the problem is, man, this is frustrating to me because I would like to say five things all at the same time. Let me share this with you out of Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to give you your answer to whatever your problem is real quickly. So it's going to be so simple. Some of you are going to think, oh, oh, no, that's not my problem. It's more complex than that. This is how simple it is right here in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's how simple it is. Whatever problem you've got, it's your flesh that's the problem. Now, I'm aware that not everybody here is on the same page. The Bible, when it's talking about flesh, isn't talking about skin like what we often talk about. The word flesh, the Greek word is sarx, and it's, you can go into a lot of things, but it basically is talking about your physical body and your soulish part that isn't renewed, that's not redeemed yet. Uh, when you got born again, you were given a brand new spirit. And in the spirit, you are a completely brand new person, but we have a mind that didn't instantly change. You know, when you got born again, if you were fat when you got born again, you're still going to be fat after you get born again. Your body didn't change. And you know what? Before you got born again, you had your memories and you had things that happened to you and your mind was filled with all of those things. When you get born again, your mind doesn't instantly change. You still got the same mind. You got your memories, not my memories. You don't instantly think right. That's your flesh, your soul and your body combination that has not been renewed by the Spirit of the Lord. But in the Spirit, you're a brand new person. So the answer is just this simple. In the Spirit, you are identical to Jesus. You got His attitude. You got His ability. 
You've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, 18 and 19. He's praying that your eyes would be open, that you would see the exceeding greatness of His power towards you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Brothers, you still, you have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus from the dead. That ought to be enough to handle whatever your problem is. The average Christian says, oh God, I know that you're all powerful. I know that you can do anything. Oh God, would you please move? You know what? You're thinking carnally. You're thinking that you're just a mere human being and that you can do nothing. And so God, would you please move? You've already started from unbelief. Because if you've been born again, you are now a new person in Christ. You have His power and authority. The Lord told you to resist the devil and He will flee from you, not from God. He placed His power in you. You are the mobile office of Jesus. You have His power and authority and you have to resist the devil. You have to release this power. Instead of saying, oh God, stretch forth your hand and heal this person. He says, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He says, you go cast out devils, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers and raise the dead. He told you to do it. And some of you are thinking, I could never do that. You're carnal. You are looking at the flesh. You are looking at yourself. The key to the Christian life any problem that you've got, it's because you are approaching things out of your ability, out of your intellect, out of your power. But I'm telling you, brothers, it's just simple. When you get born again, you become a brand new person and you have the life of God on the inside of you. You can do anything, anything, anything that God wants you to do. There is no limit when you are walking in the Spirit Instead of walking in your flesh, in your own mental ability, in your own physical strength. And you know, this is one of the liabilities of guys. Guys just think, you know, we're tough. We can do this. Women as a whole, I know there's a lot of women watching tonight. But as a whole, women recognize their frailty more than men. They aren't trying to be macho. Now, sad to say, well, you see role reversals and... <laughs> Things are changing, but I'm saying as a whole, women are more receptive to realizing their need for God. And that's why women tend to turn to the Lord quicker than men because men are going to take care of it themselves. They're going to do it their way. Man, we had Jeremy Pearson's uh, minister with us in uh, January, and he preached an awesome, awesome message on who cares and it was all about you're supposed to cast your care over on the Lord. And he was talking about who cares. And anyway, there were some great examples that he gave. But who was this that got up and, man, I wish I could remember who this was. But anyway, he was preaching on all of this. And somebody just got up and said something about that they can handle it. I can handle this. It's just like when we're trying to go someplace. Women will ask directions, but guys, no, I got this. We don't want to admit that we haven't done it. You know what that is? That's the flesh. When you are trusting in yourself, it limits the power of God flowing through you. You need to get to a place where you recognize that you are awesome in your spirit, man. But your flesh is not that good. It says in John chapter 6, verse 63, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Did you know that's what Jesus said? Most guys, and this isn't limited to guys, but I think especially guys, most guys think that your flesh is awesome. That there's things you can do, that you are confident, you aren't going to admit failure. Jesus said your flesh profits nothing. He didn't say it profits a little. He says it profits nothing. You've got to get to where you walk in the Spirit. In the Spirit, you're perfect. In the Spirit, your Spirit is as perfect right now as it's ever going to be in eternity. 
You aren't going to get a new spirit in eternity. You're going to get a glorified body and a renewed mind, but your spirit is as perfect right this moment as it will ever be. It says, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. That's not talking about your body. Your body's going to have to be changed. That's not talking about your mind. Your mind's got to be renewed. But in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Your spirit is as perfect, as pure as Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2, 16 says you have the mind of Christ. Some people will say, man, I don't. I can't even find my glasses sometimes. I, I forget all kinds of things. That's talking about this peanut-sized brain up here. But in your spirit, you have a mind. You know all things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Man, I'm putting out a lot. It's taken me decades to learn these things and I'm just spewing it out and expecting everybody to get it. Let me give you an example that, you know, when we were building a place down in Colorado Springs, long story, but I needed $3.2 million to finish that building. And for nine months, the banker told me, you'll have your money next week. And he told me that every week for nine months. And finally, at the end of nine months, we had a meeting with him. And he says, you know, it's been so long. Let's just start the process over. Let's get a new appraisal and start over. And all I could see was nine more months. And I said, this isn't right. So I said, time out. I'm going to pray something's wrong. And so I went home and there's a scripture that says when you pray in tongues, it's your spirit praying. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says when you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. So your spirit is the part of you that has a mind to Christ. This isn't talking about your physical mind. In your spirit, you have a supernatural ability to know the things of God. And when you pray in tongues, you're praying the hidden wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. You're praying the hidden wisdom of God. So all you got to do is pray that you interpret. So I said, I'm going to find out what's wrong. And I, said, I quoted those verses and I said, Father, I'm going to pray in tongues and I, I'm asking you to give me an interpretation. And I didn't get much further than from here to the back of this auditorium before God reminded me of a prophecy that I'd gotten two years before that I had just forgotten. And it says, in all of these things that God was leading me to do, he says, you aren't going to need to take out a loan. And I remember when they said this. You know, Dennis was, was there and heard this. And um, says, you won't need to take out a loan. And I was thinking, why not? And he says, because you got a bank. And I thought, what bank do I have? And then the next phrase was, your partners are the bank. You can't build enough to outdo your partners. Your partners will supply everything debt free. So I was saying, God, what's wrong? I prayed in tongues to ask for an interpretation. And immediately he brought back to my remembrance his prophecy. And I thought, God, are you telling me that you want me to get this done without a loan? $3.2 million. And at that time, that was back in 2002 or three. Um, at the rate money had been coming in and we had been saving, I sat down and, and figured it out. I'd have been like 120 years old by the time we were able to get And I thought, God, this does not make sense. Something's going to have to change. I, I, am I sure this is you? And yet every time I prayed about it, I just had more excitement about this. And so I made a decision. I said, you know what? If they come and offer me all the money I need tomorrow, I refuse it. I'm going to do this debt free. Sure enough, the next day, they said, all right, you're approved. We got it for $4 million. They said, you need more than the 3.2. And they approved me for $4 million. And I said, you're too late. And I turned it down. <laughs> and did you know, in 14 months from that day, we moved into that building debt free. And then we've done all of this. Here's $75 million debt free on top of our normal expenses. And I'm telling you, it was because in my spirit, I already had these things. And all I had to do was quit walking in the flesh, quit dealing with things in the natural, quit trying to figure it out through just natural means. 
And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is so simple, most people miss it. But this is really how simple it is. In your spirit, you've got everything that you need. You've got all the wisdom that you need. You've got all of the anointing that you need. You've got all of the joy and peace. Matter of fact, right here in this context, just a few verses down, the fruit of the spirit. This is telling you what's in your spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You've already got this. People are saying, oh God, just give me joy. How can God give you something that he's already given you? Oh God, I just need joy. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. You know, right here, I just gave Daniel my Bible. So Daniel's got my Bible. And if Daniel would say, oh, Andrew, give me your Bible. How do you respond to somebody who's asking for something that you just gave them? Mm -hmm. yeah. I wouldn't know how to respond. I'd probably just... <laughs> stupid. I'd probably just stand here and wonder, what's wrong with Daniel? Right? Kind of like God's response to you. You're praying and asking for something and you don't hear a thing. What's going on? Give me my Bible. <laughs> it's because if God could be confused, God would be confused. Yeah. I can imagine the father looking over at Jesus and saying, didn't you tell them that I've given you all things? You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Why are they asking to be healed? Didn't you tell them that by your stripes they were healed? Why are you asking God to do what he's already done? I know some of you are thinking I'm making a big deal out of nothing, but it's, it is a big deal. You are asking God to heal you. Why? Because you don't believe he did what he said he'd do. Well, I can prove to you he didn't do it. Right here's my doctor's report. All the doctor can do is, is check your flesh. They can't see what's in your spirit. In your spirit, you have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You got raising from the dead power on the inside of you. And your answer is as simple as walking in the spirit instead of in your flesh. But my flesh hurts. Well, forget it. Let your flesh dict. Well, how can I do that? Man, you have been empowered to live in the Spirit. God would be unjust to tell you to walk in the Spirit if you can't do it. Well, what is walking in the Spirit? Some people think it's walking around with your hands folded like this or your collar turned around backwards. That's not walking in the Spirit. Again, Jesus said... It's the spirit that quickens the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You want to know what walking in the spirit is? It's walking in the word. What does the word say? The word says by stripes you were healed. Not are going to be healed or can be healed. You were healed. And you put that together with Ephesians 1.19 where you have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and many other scriptures. It's a done deal. You've already got it. But it's in your spirit. And you've got to walk in the spirit. You've got to walk in what God's word says. And yet most people are more moved by the word of a doctor than you are by the word of God. I'm not against doctors. I'm sure we've got doctors in here. If it wasn't for doctors, all the Christians would be dead. They hadn't been trusting God. 
But I'm saying, man, why don't you just draw on this supernatural life and leave the, you know, the doctors for the sick people? Amen. I'm not against veterinarians. But I wouldn't take my dog to a vet. You know why? Don't have a dog. <laughs> if you're taking your dog to a vet, that's fine. But you know, I don't have a dog. The reason I don't go to a doctor is because I'm not sick. Even when I feel sick. Even when my body tells me I'm sick. I'm walking in the spirit and the spirit says that I was healed. And I am going to believe that. I don't care what it looks like. I believe what God spoke to me. God gave me a dream about Kenneth coming here and dedicating this building November the 3rd. Anyway, it's a long story, but I, I know it's a word from God. And I'm walking in the word that God gave me. In the natural, it can't be done, but you hide and watch. Y'all are welcome to come to our dedication November the 3rd. Amen. And you hide and watch. We will be in that building. And I'm believing it'll even be in August that we'll be able to start the school year. And some of you, see, you just immediately, well, I'd never do that. You're sticking yourself out there. You could fail. There are some people that are so afraid of failure that they won't do anything. And they wind up being the biggest failure of all. There's nobody as big a failure as a person who won't do anything because they're afraid of failing. You know, when you're a little kid and you learn how to ride a bicycle, probably most of us didn't do it perfectly the first time. You fell. But you know what? You get up and you go again, and now all of us can ride a bicycle. It's the same thing. You have to just step out. Man, I've made enough mistakes along the way, but you know what? God has blessed me in spite of me. God does not, when you fall off your back, God doesn't say, you sorry thing. If you'd have done what I told you, you wouldn't have fallen and you're no good. See if I'll ever help you again. No, he'll get you like a parent and say, look, you went 10 feet, try it again. And he'll encourage you. I'm telling you, you need to get over this fear of failure. The biggest failure of all is when you do nothing. That's a failure. And brothers, I'm saying this to you in love. But I know we can't have this many men together without a lot of people here that you are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. You are taking the easiest route. You're just floating downstream. And God loves you and I love you, but I love you enough to tell you that God made you for more than that. And in your spirit, if you are born again, you've got everything that it takes for you to succeed. You've already got it all, but you've got to renew your mind. It says in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word transforms, a Greek word metamorpho that we get uh, transformation from, like a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. We get metamorphosis from. And if you want that kind of change in your life, it comes by the renewing of your mind. And you do that through the Word of God. The Word of God is spirit and it is life. And as you start basing your life and everything on what God's Word says instead of what your flesh feels, then you are walking in the spirit and this supernatural life of God will flow through you. You know, I mentioned this woman that I just read her book in the last few days. And she was the one that was an alcoholic, drug addict, uh, PTSD, ADD, bipolar, and all of this stuff. And she was, she was a Christian. And for, I don't know what period of time, but over a decade, she dealt with this stuff and she was trying to overcome these things and couldn't do it. She actually took a um, razor blade and cut in her stomach, I hate me. And she would slit her wrist and attempt suicide and do all of these things. But the whole problem with her. She was a Christian. She was going to church and Bible studies every week. And sometimes she'd take a fifth of vodka and drink it right before Bible study. She hated herself. She felt like a total failure. But you know, the problem was her, that she, that was her identity. She thought this is who I am. I'm a loser. And even though she would go sometimes months at a time 
When a temptation would come, she would just identify with it and, and she would fall. And what happened, a friend at Bible study told her, says, this is not who you are. This is not who God made you to be. And just helped her to see that there was a different her living on the inside. Not the one that she was seeing in the mirror. And brothers, I can tell you, I, I'm saying this in love, but there are people here that you don't have any faith in yourself. You don't have any confidence in yourself. And you shouldn't have confidence in your flesh, but you should have confidence in who you are in Christ. You should know that God created you for a purpose and he has written down nothing but good in his book for you. And you still have that potential. It doesn't matter how far you've gone in the other direction. God has not changed his plans for you. And when you get born again, that old person leaves and you are a brand new person on the inside. You need to get delivered from yourself. You need to get out of this. Some of you have developed a persona that you don't like, but you feel trapped by it. I'm just trying to be honest. I'm not going to be a hypocrite and act like something that I'm not. Well, it's because your identity is in the flesh. But you are perfect in your spirit. You are a brand new person in your spirit. It just depends who you consider to be the real you. If you think the flesh is the real you, then you're a hypocrite to act in love and to go around and say, I'll lay hands on you and you will, you will be healed. Because in your flesh, you don't have that power. But if you are walking in the spirit, you're a hypocrite to start speaking forth all of your limitations and problems and talking about that because that's not the real you. If you feel trapped like, I can't help it, I wish I was different, but this is who I am, it's because you're in the flesh. I'm telling you, in the spirit, you are a brand new person. You're awesome. Amen. Amen. You may not like the way I look or talk. I don't. <laughs> I have my friends make fun of me. <laughs> I've got my 50th anniversary coming up on the 23rd. And people from all over the world sent me greetings. And every one of them would say something and say, well, Andrew called and said, hi there, how are you? And they <laughs> make fun of my voice. You know what? If I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. But I'm telling you, I'm awesome in the spirit. You just yeah. can't see my spirit. And you've got to get to where you go beyond your flesh and find out who you are in the spirit. And you can't do it by looking in the mirror. It's not, you can't, you can't feel it. Some people will say, but I just don't feel like God loves me. Well, then you're in the flesh. Because the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. In your spirit, you've got so much love that, man, you can't handle any more love. Well, I don't feel it. Well, that just means you're in the flesh. Well, aren't I supposed to feel it? Feelings are fine when they come, but man, if you are being led by feelings, you are a carnal person. You are in the flesh. There's lots of times I don't feel anything. Some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen in my life, I didn't feel a thing. My son was raised from the dead after being dead for five hours in a morgue, stripped naked, with the toe tag on, pronounced dead, and in a cooler. And when they told us about it, man, I felt grief, I felt panic, I felt everything, but I just decided I don't care how I feel. This is what the Word says. Jesus bore my sorrows, carried my grief. I am not going to grieve. I started praising God, and I guarantee you, I did not feel like praising God. But I started praising God, and when I did... Man, faith rose up. I, I started laughing. I told my wife as we were driving right by this property right here. And we didn't have it at that time. That was in 2001. We were driving right by this property. And I said, this is going to be the greatest thing we've ever seen. She thought I'd lost it. And when we got into the springs, my son, just five minutes after they called, he just sat up and started talking. Come on. And that's been 17 years ago, and he is healthy today. He has no brain damage. 
no more than he had before. And I'm telling you, it was a miracle, and I didn't feel like it. I'm telling you, when you don't feel like it, and you go ahead and do what the Word says, that's the highest form of faith. When you're feeling it, when you have goosebumps all up and down your spine, you're tempted to get out of the Spirit and say, Oh, I know God is here because I feel it. Man, that's wrong. If feelings come, enjoy them. I'm not against feelings. I, I have feeling. There's times that I actually feel the power of God flow through me. And when I feel it, praise God. But did you know what? When I don't feel it, I don't act any differently. I am not going to act different because I feel something. That's walking in the Spirit. But there's, well, I just don't feel it. Well, pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. That's childish. I don't know why anybody comes to my meetings. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I do, I'm saying this because I love you. We're guys in here. We're supposed to be adults. And yet we're acting like, well, well you don't understand. I've had this person say this. This has happened. Man, get over it. Well, I was abused when I was a child. It was 40 years ago. Get over it. <laughs> Amen. Brothers, I'm telling you, you're loaded. You got everything that you need. But you aren't going to see this looking in the mirror. You aren't going to have enough people. There's not enough people saying the things that I say tonight. And so you're going to be around a lot of people that will just pull you down to their level. They'll try and tell you, oh, quit thinking that big. You're going to set yourself up for failure First thing a doctor will tell you is don't get your hopes up. They'll give you a worst case scenario. Man, the very thing you need to do is get your hopes up. The whole world system is against everything I'm talking about. You aren't going to get this in very many places. The only place you can consistently get this is through the Word of God. You're going to have to get into God's Word, which is spirit and, and life, and you are going to have to meditate on this until you see yourself differently. And there may be things in your flesh, and I'm not talking about just your physical body, but in your emotions and in your actions and things that you don't like. But I can guarantee you, your spirit is perfect. And if you could ever start seeing who you are and say, this is who I am, and this is the way I'm going to live. Brothers, you'd go home different. You would be a different person. Some of you were raised that, well, we just don't show much affection. We just are, you know, tough people. We don't express our emotions and stuff like that. That's your flesh. In the spirit, you're full of love and joy and peace. And you ought to start just acting like you are who God says you are. You ought to go and just lay hands on people because the Bible said believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And without having any kind of light, blinding flash of light, just do what God's Word says and it would shock you what would happen. I'm telling you, there's so many times that I've done things that in the natural it just didn't look, I didn't feel a thing and yet some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen happen or when I felt nothing. It's when you go ahead and do what the Word says, when you don't feel like it, that's the highest form of faith that you can get. You're walking in the Spirit. So it just is this simple. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in what God's Word says about you. You can't do that until you find out what God says about you. You need to learn but man, you need to dig in and once you get that and start walking in the Spirit, I guarantee you it's going to transform your life. And let me tonight just say that I know in my heart, I don't know this by the natural, but I know in my Turn over to the book of Ephesians. What I'm going to be sharing during this is I'm going to, I can't say that I'm going to teach verse by verse through Ephesians, but I'm going to be teaching the book of Ephesians. I won't have time to go verse by verse, but man, this is powerful. Some of the most important things that the Lord has shown me have been from this book. 
And this book is unique. It and Colossians are two of the letters that Paul wrote that are kind of unique in the way that they do things. The first three chapters of Ephesians are basically all about who you are in Christ and what you have. It's identity type of scriptures. And then the, the last three chapters of the book of Ephesians are because of who we are, this is how we should act. And most people don't usually put these things together. They will either get focused on who they are and they get carried away with that and forget that we are the salt and the light of the earth and that we have an obligation to act certain ways. But, but Ephesians put this in a balance that's really, really good. And I think that this will bless you and, and be a real um, encouragement to you. So let's start here in Ephesians chapter 1. It starts, and again, I'm not going to be able to go verse by verse through the whole book, but a lot of Ephesians chapter 1, I will cover verse by verse. And it says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that this wasn't just Paul saying grace to you from him. This is from God. God is gracious towards you and God has released peace towards you. I could spend hours on this one thing because again, most people don't practically believe this, but the truth is God is gracious towards you. God's not mad at you. He's not angry. He's not even in a bad mood. God loves you. And I know some of you are thinking, well, you don't know me. You don't know God. God loves you just like you are. Grace and peace is multiplied unto you. And then it says, and these are some of the things I want to really highlight in this first chapter. In verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is what the word says. Notice it didn't say that he can bless us. That if you will do certain things and meet a certain standard, he will bless you. This says he hath. It's already done. He's already blessed you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And most people are so controlled by what they see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. They are controlled by their physical circumstances that when the Bible says this, they just immediately unplug and say, well, it's not true in my life. I'm sick. The doctor just told me I'm going to die. Or I'm poor. I can't even pay my bills. Or I'm having relationship problems with my children, with my, with my mate or whatever. And people look at circumstances and they think this isn't true. But it is true. God has already commanded a blessing upon you. You don't have to get God to bless you. He's already blessed you. It doesn't automatically come to pass because you have to receive it by faith. But notice it says that it has already been done. I could literally, uh, I've got a teaching on this entitled, uh, You've Already Got It. And if you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to get that teaching. But the whole teaching is, a lot of it's based on Ephesians chapter 1, that you're already blessed, you're already healed, you're already delivered. You already have love, joy, and peace, and all of these things. You don't need to pray and ask God for it. You've already got it. What you need to do is begin to believe and receive what you have. Thank you for both of those amens. <laughs> but again, most people are so dominated by what they see and experience that they think, look, this is just religious talk you've got. In reality, I am not blessed. But I'm telling you, in reality, you are blessed. You have to believe it in order to see it manifest. When you believe is not when God blesses you, it's already done. You know, I often liken it to this. It's like a television signal. Right now, there's television signals. There's radio signals in this room. You know, we're using a wireless microphone. This is sending an FM signal back there, and it's received, and then it's rebroadcast. There's not only this signal. There's all kinds of signals on in here. And if a person says, I don't believe it, why? Because you can't feel it? Because you can't hear it? That doesn't mean that the signal's not here. It just means that you aren't turned on and tuned into it. You aren't receiving it. But those signals are here. 
And all you'd have to do is to take a television set and plug it in, turn it on, tune it in to a frequency. And when you start seeing the image, it's not when the image is broadcast. It's already there. You just weren't receiving it. And it's the same thing with God. He has already blessed you with everything. Healing is already a done deal. You don't have to ask God to heal you. You don't have to ask God to bless you. I have people come forward in my meetings and they'll say, would you please pray that God would just show me his love, pour out his love in my life? No, I won't do that. And some people think, well, why not? What's wrong with that? That's an insult because he says he's already committed his love towards you. God has already released it. God loves you more than you could ever understand. There is not, it's not God that's turned the switch off. It's your set that's plugged in to the wrong station. You're tuned into the wrong thing. You're listening to the 10 spies network instead of listening to the two spies that have a faith report. And for you to say, oh God, would you please love me? That's an insult to God when he says, I loved you so much that I gave my son, in all of these other scriptures, Romans chapter 5, he's committed his love toward us. You don't need God to love you. What you need to do is get your set fixed. You need to ask for a repairman. Amen. Instead of calling the station and say, would you start transmitting? What you need to do is say, would you please come fix my set? Would you help me to learn to receive? If a person would come to me and say, look, I know that God loves me. I know these scriptures, but man, I'm having a hard time focusing on it. I've just got this happening and that happening. Would you pray with me? I'm going to share some other scriptures with you right here in this chapter that talk about that. Yes, I'll pray with you to help you understand and receive, but I am not going to approach God like, God, would you please take away my depression and would you give me joy? The Bible says that you already have joy unspeakable and full of glory. It says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. I'm trying real hard not to stay on this one verse. But I could. The thing that really changed my life. I was born again when I was eight. When I was 18, I had a miraculous encounter with the Lord. I knew that God loved me intuitively, but I couldn't see it. I couldn't understand. How could God love me? I didn't love me. I wasn't doing everything right. I was an introvert. I was afraid to talk to people. And there was just so many things in my life that were wrong. And I just couldn't understand how God loved me. And the thing that turned my life around was when God revealed to me that I had a spirit. Most people don't acknowledge the spirit realm. They only recognize this physical body and then the mental, emotional part and that's who they think they are. But there is a spirit part of you that when you get born again, you become a brand new person and you become identical to Jesus in your spirit because it is his spirit that was sent into your heart. God is a spirit, John 4, 24, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In your spirit, you are already blessed. You've got the fullness of God on the inside of you if you're born again. If you aren't born again, we can take care of that tonight. We will give an invitation and you can come and make Jesus your Lord. And the moment you get born again, you have the fullness of the Godhead living in you bodily. And according to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. These things are in you in abundance, but it's not in your mental, emotional part. It's not in your tangible physical body. It's in your spirit and it takes faith to release what is on the inside of you. But this is what changed my life is when I quit going by just how I felt and I started going by what the word of God said about me and my spirit. I started walking in this and, and this is what this is all about. Again, I could spend a lot of time on that, but look at all of the, I want to just read these verses and please Pay attention to the terminology that's used. This is so important. This is awesome. So in verse 3, he hath blessed us. In verse 4, it says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God chose you before he even created the world. 
That means it's not based on your performance. That means he didn't look at you and say, oh, they are so sincere. They're trying so hard. Now I'm going to release my power. Before you or I existed, before the world existed, God chose us. I can't fully explain that. I think that's beyond human ability to understand. But I can certainly receive it and believe that God loves me not because I'm lovely, but because he is love. And he hath chosen us. He chose you. Many are called, but few are chosen. You know what that's talking about? God calls everyone. Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. He wants every single person that has ever breathed to have relationship with him, but not everybody will receive it. And so he chooses those who receive him. And he, through his foreknowledge, knew that you and I would someday turn to him. And he chose you before you ever existed. Man, that's awesome. You are chosen. And if it happened before the foundation of the world, it's not according to your performance. You don't, God doesn't love you more when you do everything right. And he doesn't love you less when you do everything wrong. Now, you will love God more when you seek Him and keep your heart sensitive and turn off the junk and focus on the Word of God and live a holy life. You will love God more and you will receive more benefit because you are in tune with Him. But God doesn't love you more if you do things right. He doesn't love you less if you do things wrong. Man, I could preach on that for weeks. In the next verse, it says, having predestinated us. Notice the terminology. He's already done this. This is not something that's yet to come. You are already predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. None of these words are talking about your goodness, that you earned this, that because you've performed so well, God has chosen you and promoted you. No, he, he chose you before the foundation of the world. He pre predestined you according to his pleasure, his goodness. Again, I could unplug right here, and I've got a teaching entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. Most people think that you just muddle through life the best you can, and you ask God to bless what you're doing. God formed you with a purpose. Psalms 139. All of your days were written in his book before one of them existed. This is why abortion is just absolute murder. It is murder. And a person is a person from the moment of conception, has an absolute different DNA from the mother and stuff. And God, from the moment of your conception, he had a, well, actually, according to this verse, before the foundation of the world, he had already chosen you and predestined you. And God has a plan. And so it's not up to you to just do your own thing and ask God to bless it. What were you created for? What is God's purpose for your life? And you know, when I teach on this and have an entire conference on just how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will, I'll give invitations and it's not unusual to have 80% or 90% of a group like this stand and say, I don't know for sure that I'm doing what God wants me to do. I hope I am, but they don't know for sure. I can guarantee you, you aren't going to find God's will accidentally. You don't just stumble into it. It's not fate. You have to pursue it. Satan is going to fight you and try and divert your life away from God wants you to do. And if you don't have a goal set and know where you're going, there is no chance of you getting there. You need to find out what God's purpose is. You have been predestinated according to the pleasure of his goodwill. And in verse 6 it says, To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Did you know that this term accepted right here, the Greek word that is used here is only used one other time in scripture. And that's in Luke chapter one, where the angel Gabriel appeared unto Mary and said, hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Mary was highly favored. That's the same Greek word. The only other time it's used is talking about you and me that we are highly favored. We are accepted in the beloved. 
You know, some people exalt Mary, and I think that Mary was certainly blessed. What an honor to be chosen to be the mother of the Lord. But, you know, Jesus even said that when a woman came and said, Blessed are the womb that is the womb that bear thee and the paps that you've sucked. And he said, Yea, rather blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. Jesus himself said that the people who receive him and his message that he came to bring are more blessed than his mother. This right here says that we are highly favored and blessed just like Mary was. I'm not trying to pull her down. I'm exalting you. I'm saying that you are blessed. You are highly favored. And notice that it didn't say that you could be blessed. You might be blessed. If you will do these things, God will bless you and highly favor you. You are already blessed and highly favored. It's done. Did you know everything you're praying for, God's already done it. It's already done. Some of you are saying, man, I need to be healed. 1 Peter 2, 24, by whose stripes we were healed. It's already been done. You're already healed. Healing power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, already lives on the inside of you if you are born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have those two things, we will give you an opportunity to pour tonight's over to receive that. But if you are born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Not just a little token of it, not just a little taste of it. You have the same quality and quantity of power that raised Christ from the dead. You have the same faith. We have like precious faith is what the apostle Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1. He said, Peter, an apostle to them that have obtained like precious faith. That's 2 Peter 1, 1. You have obtained. It's not something that you can obtain. You have obtained it. And it says through the righteousness of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You didn't obtain it through your works and through your efforts. You obtained it when you got born again. God gave you faith. It was one of those things that was listed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. It's a fruit of the Spirit. You have the faith of Christ on the inside of you. And many of you are just looking at me like, brother, that you don't know me. You don't know you. You don't know the real you. You only know yourself after the flesh. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Henceforth we don't know any man after the flesh, because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. There is a part of you that is brand new. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And brothers and sisters, everything I'm saying here, it is an accomplished fact in your spirit. But if you don't know it, it doesn't benefit you. God's people perish for a lack of knowledge. It says in Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, Paul was praying a prayer for Philemon, his friend. And he says, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. You can't acknowledge something that doesn't already exist. He didn't say the communication of your faith would be effectual by you praying more, by you fasting, by you getting people to lay hands on you and agree. It says it comes by acknowledging what you already have. I know what I'm saying goes right over the head of most people because, again, we are so focused on this physical realm and we just look in the physical realm. And if I say that you're blessed financially, the first thing you do is look at your bank account. You look at your wallet and you judge whether what I'm saying is true based on your experience. I love you. I'm not saying this to hurt anybody, but if that's the way that you think, you're what the Bible calls carnal. Carnal doesn't mean just terrible, sinful God hater. Now, all of those people are carnal, but carnal means of the five senses. It means you are dominated and controlled by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And the vast majority of Christians are carnal, totally dominated by what they see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. So the Bible says you're blessed with all blessings and you go to your checkbook. Well, I'm not blessed. You're healed. Well, I'm not healed because you got a doctor's report. I'm not saying that those things don't exist, but there is more than just this physical world. There's more than, there's a spiritual world out here. There are demons and angels in this place tonight. 
and somebody says, I don't see him. If you don't believe it because you can't see him, you're carnal. Doesn't mean you're terrible. It doesn't mean you're sinful. It means you are limited to what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. God is a spirit. And for you to start seeing the power of God operate in your life, you got to break loose from just being carnal and recognize that there's a spiritual world out there. And there's also a spiritual world on the inside of you. There is a you on the inside that you don't know. A friend of mine, it might be... uh, I forgot who this is, but anyway, some friend of mine, I think it was uh, Rich Van Winkle, wrote a book on identity, and he's got a person standing in front of a mirror, and you can kind of see over the person's shoulder, and you can see kind of what they look like, but the image in the mirror is a lion, (laughs) and he's talking about your identity, and would to God that we had some spiritual mirror that we could look in that would show you who you really are. Oh, we do. Right here. James chapter one says, whoever looks into this perfect law of liberty is like a man beholding his face in a mirror. This is the representation of who you are. Who are you? You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. You are already chosen. You are already predestined. You are already accepted in the beloved the same way that Mary was. You are highly favored. In verse 7, it says, in whom we have redemption, not that we can obtain redemption. We've already got redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Verse 8, wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence. And I wish I had time to just emphasize every one of these. I encourage you, when you go home, read this. Think about it. Everything that he's saying is in the past tense. It's not something that is obtainable if you would just do enough and if you would live holy enough and read the Bible enough and go to church. No, you've already got these things. You don't have to do anything to get it. You've already got it. Now, you've got to do things to renew your mind and begin to understand and receive what God has done. But just understanding that, God, I'm not changing you. You've already blessed me with everything. I've already got it. I'm not reading the word so that you could bless me. I'm reading the word to find out how blessed I am. There's a difference. And so he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Notice again, he isn't going to make known. He has already done it. And some of you think, well, man, I don't don't know what God's will is. Your spirit man does. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, that you have the mind of Christ. It's not up here in your little peanut-sized brain. It's in your spirit. You have the mind of Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. And again, see, this is where carnal Christians disconnect. They think, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't know all things. I can't even find my glasses when they're on top of my head. I forget things all of the time. I just don't, the Bible is so hard to understand. It's not talking about your physical brain knows all things. Those of you that have been Bible college students can prove that. You take a test and man, you don't know all things. But your spirit man knows all things. Uh, uh, Colossians chapter, um, man, I just went blank on where this is. I think it's Colossians 2.10. But it says, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Your spirit, man, has been renewed in knowledge. You know all things. You have an unction. You have the mind of Christ. And so instead of going around and saying, well, I just don't, I don't know. I can't understand the things of God. You're hung by your tongue. You're operating in the flesh, in the carnal realm, and you are blocking what God wants to do. In your spirit, you know all things. He's already abounded towards you. You've got wisdom. And I'm not going to take time right now, but I've got an entire series on this. Uh, You know, all of these things I'm saying, I've got... Multiple teachings that go into depth on each one of these. But your spirit man already has the mind of Christ 
And then it says, when you pray in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, your spirit prays, the part of you that has the mind of Christ, that has this perfect knowledge. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, if you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. You know how you draw this mind of Christ out? Praying in tongues. You're speaking the hidden wisdom of God. Hebrews, I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, you are speaking mysteries and the wisdom of God. And all you got to do is just ask God, what am I saying? And that wisdom that's in your spirit will begin to flood out into your mind and God will reveal things to you. I tell you, if you don't speak in tongues, you need this gift of speaking in tongues. It is powerful. And if you have the gift of speaking in tongues, you need to use it. A lot of Christians receive it and they speak in tongues one time to prove to themselves that they have the Holy Spirit and then they don't use what they've got. But when you speak in tongues, it's just like flipping a switch and turning on the power of God. In verse 10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained. Notice again the terminology, it's already done. We have obtained an inheritance. Some people think when I get to heaven, man, what a day that's going to be. In the sweet by and by, it'll be awesome. But I'm telling you in the rough now and now, you have the power of God. It's not just... You know, in the sweet by and by, it's steak on the plate while you wait. Amen. So we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Not something that could happen, that if you'll ask for it, it'll happen. No, you were already sealed. Everything that we've read so far is something that is already done. And if you don't perceive it in your life, if you can't see it, it's not because it's not done. It's because you're on the wrong channel. You are looking with your eyes and trying to feel with your physical feelings instead of walking by faith and perceiving who you really are in the spirit. You've already got all of these things. And it says in verse 14, talking about the sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the, glory, unto the praise of his glory. This earnest is what we would talk today. It's a, it's a down payment. The Holy Spirit, this gift of speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit are like a down payment, a proof to us of what's in the unseen realm. When you, pre, when you speak in tongues, when you operate in a word of knowledge, those are physical proofs of the things that you, we can't see. They are manifested and it's our earnest. It's the proof of what we already have. In verse 15, he says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And notice this prayer through the end of this chapter. This is awesome. You know, when I first got turned on to the Lord and God began to start showing me that in the spirit I had these things, even though I couldn't see them in my physical body and I couldn't see it in my physical realm. This is a prayer that I prayed nearly daily and I put my name in there because this is a prayer that Paul prayed. We know that he was led according to the Holy Spirit and the Bible says over in uh, Jane, uh, let's see, 1 John chapter 4, verse 15, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of him. So the whole key is, are you praying according to God's will? This is a prayer in the Bible that Paul was led to pray. You know that this is God's will. So all you got to do is just put your name in there and say, Father, instead of praying Paul, praying for the... Uh, Ephesians say, Father, I'm praying this, that you would open up the eyes of my understanding. Just put your name in there. And there's also a prayer in the third chapter. I'll be dealing with that uh, sometime either tomorrow or the next day. But you pray those two prayers and you put your name in there. And I tell you what, you know you have the petitions that you've desired of the Lord. 
And let me ask you this. If you were going to write down a prayer, let's say you were going to write out a prayer for somebody and it was going to be 2,000 years in the future, how would, you, how would you pray for them? Think about that just for a second. What would you pray? How would you pray for them? And you know, I've literally been in thousands of churches and heard the prayers of people. And I can guarantee you that the prayer of most people would be something like, Oh God, bless these people. Which the Bible here says you're already blessed. Oh God, move. All of this says he's already moved. Oh God, pour out your spirit. Which this, I'm going to read some scriptures to you. You've already got the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It's opposite what most of us would do. Most of us would say, God, please touch these people. Reveal yourself. Move in their life. Send revival. We would be asking God to do something. Paul is praying instead that you would get a revelation of what you've already got. Totally different than what most people are praying. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love to you, but if I could, if I could listen to your individual prayers... I can guarantee you that the majority of people, and you guys are the cream of the crop. This is Thursday night. You came out to a convention center to listen to a hick from Texas. You're an absolute fanatic. Or you were drug here by a fanatic, one of the two. But I mean, you guys are the exception. And yet I bet you that the majority of people in here, when you pray, oh God, please heal me, instead of saying, thank you that by your stripes I was healed. Oh God, please pour out love in my life instead of saying, I've got love, joy, and peace. And most of us are praying and asking God to do what he says he's already done. You know, if God could be confused, I believe he would be confused. I could see him looking at Jesus and saying, didn't you tell them that by your stripes they were healed? Why are these people begging me to heal them? Didn't you tell them? This prayer is completely different than the way most people pray. Instead of praying, oh God, touch them. Oh God, send revival. Oh God, move. It's, oh God, open up their eyes to what they already have. That's one of the reasons that we aren't seeing the results that we should be seeing because we're praying wrong. So look at this prayer. He's praying this prayer. He ceases not to make mention of you, mentioning you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And if you want to be technical, if you go back over here to verse um, 9, it says he's already made known unto us the mystery of his will. So he's just praying that we would get revelation of what he's already done. God has actually given you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. You just need to start using what you've got. So he's praying that the Lord would give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And look at verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Man, I have studied every one of these words. I've actually preached messages on just one of these words. An hour. There is so much in this. This word understanding here is the Greek word dianoia. And it means deep thought. Not just thought, but deep thought. Most Christians are very superficial. They just get something and they say, Oh, praise God, by his stripes I'm healed. And they run with it. And then they get confused. Well, I believe by his stripes I'm healed. How come I'm not healed? You have to let that soak in on you. It has to go beyond a surface level. It has to become a heart revelation. Matter of fact, you know, I mentioned uh, Teresa and had her come up here. And in her book, this is one of the things that when she first came to school, she kept saying they were talking about revelation knowledge. And she was confused. What's revelation knowledge? And uh, you need to get her book and get her explanation. She does a great job on it. But there's a difference between just information and you being able to quote a scripture and then it becoming revelation to you to where it just ignites something on the inside. It releases something on the inside of you. And most Christians don't take the time. They're too busy. I mean, they got to go watch the Super Bowl. 
I'm not against the Super Bowl. I'm not against any of this stuff. But I'm saying we are so carnal. We are just plugged in. We spend so much time on the phone. Not talking to people, but playing games and looking up stuff. I just got more things to do than to play games. But we are so carnal, we're so controlled by this that we don't allow things to sink in. It's like taking a sponge. You can take a sponge and you can totally put it in water, but if you just put it below the surface and pull it back, it'll just get wet around the edges. It won't soak all the way through. You have to put that thing in there and submerge it. Did you know that this is what the word baptize means? Contrary to religious traditions, it doesn't mean to sprinkle. It doesn't mean to dip. It means to just hold them under until they really repent. (laughs) Amen. And you need to get baptized in the Word. You need to be so immersed in it that it saturates. It doesn't just go around the edges, but it literally becomes revelation to you. It comes alive. It becomes a part of you. This is what he's praying, that the eyes of your understanding, this deep thought, would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Notice it's his calling. People will say, God has called me to do this. Well, yes, it is true that he calls you, but it's really his calling. God's wanting to live through you. It's not supposed to be you. It's not your ministry. It's not your calling. It's not your vocation. Everything in your life should be Him. It's the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Did you know when you talk about the glory of God, most people close their eyes and think about heaven and the throne and Ezekiel 1 and 10 about the glory, the uh, rainbow around the throne and all of the seraphims and the living creatures and and they think of all of these things. But notice it says the riches of his, uh, of his glory in the saints. What you have on the... Man, I, I, it's hard for me to say this. I know that most people, it just, it's wasted on saying it. But what you have on the inside of you, if it had to be replaced, it would bankrupt heaven. The glory in heaven. You've got that on the inside of you right now. You're, it's glorious. You've got the fullness of the Godhead belly, dwelling in you bodily. It's not out there someplace. We pray these stupid prayers about, oh God, we come and ask you to meet with us today. What a stupid prayer. When he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. And yet you say, come be with us. And oh God, go with us as we leave. How dumb can you get and still breathe? (laughs) I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but oh God, please go with me today. That prayer didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need a prayer to get above your nose. God's right here. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray, so you can look at God and say, Father. Man, the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in us. If you could hold up this spiritual mirror and believe what it says about you right now, I'm showing you who you are in the spirit. It's awesome. I can't relate to people that get depressed. You know, it's now been 53 years since the Lord touched my life. And I guess maybe until I got this revelation, it it might be 50 years since I've been depressed or discouraged. I don't get depressed. You can't make me depressed. You know why? Because I'm not focused on the natural things and even my own limitations and my own failures I'm looking at who I am in Christ. And when you see that you have the riches of the glory of his inheritance on the inside of you, how could you be depressed? How could you be lonely? I don't understand people being lonely. If you're lonely, it's because you are living in the physical realm and you are looking for physical people to come love you. But man, God Almighty loves you. And if you focused on that, You could just bask in his presence. You don't need anybody else. 
Now, I'm not, a, I'm not ignorant of the fact that we need each other, and I'm not telling you to go move out someplace and never see another person. But I'm saying that if you are, if, if your joy and peace and happiness is dependent upon other people, you are carnal. Amen or oh me. The riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. And then remember in verse 18, he's praying that your eyes would be open to this. In verse 19, he says, and that you would see what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. That word according to means in proportion to or to the degree of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Man, again, we could just go into every one of these words. They're powerful. But notice the power that's directed towards you is the same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And yet I have people come to me all the time and say, I know that God can heal. I know that he wants to do this, but I just don't have any power. You're denying this. You have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And I guarantee you that's enough to raise you from the dead. You know, when God created the heavens and the earth, there was zero opposition. There wasn't a devil yet. He had no opposition. Creating the universe is nothing compared to raising Jesus from the dead. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, Satan and every demon in hell was doing everything they could to stop that from happening. You know, a church that I used to go to, they had an Easter presentation that was elaborate and they went into these great things. And anyway, the resurrection scene, they had the tomb covered. And then you heard this explosion. And there was this huge amount of smoke that you couldn't see anything for a moment. And as it began to clear, you saw this person who was personified as the devil. He had been in the play the whole time. He was underneath the tombstone. The tombstone was on top of him. And Jesus was standing on top of the tombstone. That was a great picture of what the resurrection was like. And I can guarantee you Satan and all of his demons were trying to stop that tomb from being opened up. And yet Jesus blew the gates off of hell and came out with the keys of death and of hell. And he overcame all of the opposition. And you have that raising from the dead power on the inside of you. It's not out there somewhere that you have to say, oh God, stretch forth your hand and just touch this person. Oh God, come and be with us. You've already got the supernatural raising from the dead power on the inside of you. There is nothing that God has to do. He's already done it. He's put everything on the inside of you. It's up to you and me to release what God has done through faith. Faith doesn't make God respond to us. Faith is our positive response to him. Faith is reaching out and appropriating what he's already provided. And I'm telling you, every one of you in here, if you think you're the sorriest Christian in this whole place, you still have the supernatural raising from the dead power on the inside of you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, talking about John the Baptist, he was the greatest man that had ever been born among women. That included just about everybody. Greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than anybody. John the Baptist was the greatest. Nevertheless, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. If you are the least saint in this auditorium tonight, you're greater than John the Baptist, which means you're greater than Moses, greater than Elijah. You've got more power, and it's all because in your spirit you have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You do not have a power problem. you got a knowledge problem. Over in 2 Peter chapter 1, Verse 3, it says, great, or I guess it's verse 2 or 3, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of him that hath called you to glory and virtue. And yet most Christians, oh God, please just give me more peace. I'm stressed out. Could you give me peace? It says grace and peace is multiplied unto you through knowledge, not through prayer. 
And then the next verse says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things. And in the Greek, that means all things. <laughs> all things. That includes healing. That includes prosperity. That includes vision. That includes deliverance from fear and depression and loneliness. All things that pertain unto life and godliness have been given unto us through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. If you're sick tonight, you got a knowledge problem. You don't have a power problem. You've got the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You don't know what you've got. And you're asking God to give you what you've already got. You know, before I've gone down and given my Bible, I'll get off the stage and do this. But here, I give my Bible to Matt. So Matt's got my Bible. And then Matt says, Andrew, could I have your Bible? How do I respond to a person that's already got what they're asking for? I'd just probably look at Matt like your elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. Something's wrong with you. I, or I probably just wouldn't say anything because how do you respond to somebody who's asking you for what they've already got? I'd probably just be quiet, kind of like it is when we pray. And we're asking God to heal us and we don't hear anything. And we say, God, what's wrong? And he's saying, you've got it. I gave you the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Give me my Bible. <laughs> but how do you ask God for something that he's already given you? Oh, praise God. I'm young. But when you, you're saying, oh God, heal me. And he says, by his stripes, you were healed. I put within you the same power that raised Christ from the dead. What do you want me to do? You know, I heard Kenneth Copeland. For those of you who don't know, Kenneth Copeland is Jeremy's grandfather. Man, what a blessing. But I heard Kenneth Copeland one time and he was saying that he wanted to see more people healed and more things done. And he was just saying, oh God, give me more power. And the Lord stopped him and said, Kenneth, where am I going to get any more power? I've already given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You got the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Where am I going to get any more power? And again, there's some people that are listening to me right now and you're just disconnecting thinking, but I don't have any of that. You're looking, you're, you're waiting on a feeling in your body or you're wanting some kind of an epiphany or Somebody just to remove all doubt and stuff. You've got to perceive this by revelation knowledge. It has to be by faith that you see into the spiritual realm. But I'm promising you, brothers and sisters, you've got everything that you need already. You've got more than what you need. More unbelief. More doubt. More carnality. We don't have a lack of anything. There's a song that I've been singing lately that's become one of my favorite, and it says, What gift of grace is Jesus, our Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. Man, that is profound. Did you know when you're saying, Oh God, I just need this and I need that, you, you aren't esteeming Jesus. You aren't understanding what he's done. Jesus has already done everything. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's not there still purchasing things, still doing things. God isn't healing people today. He healed you 2,000 years ago. People are receiving their healing today. They're turning on their set and tuning in and receiving what has already been broadcast. But you aren't waiting on God to heal you. God is waiting on you to believe. And so take this prayer, and I don't think I finished all of this, but pray that God would open up the eyes of your understanding and show you the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. The same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Every name. Did you know cancer has a name? Jesus is above that. 
AIDS has a name. Sugar diabetes has a name. Multiple sclerosis. Anything you want to name. Jesus is above that. And the power that's on the inside of you is greater than anything that Satan could come against you with. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. No weapon will prosper, but notice you have to condemn it. When you sit there and the doctor says you're going to die and somebody says, how are you? And you say, well, I'm going to die. You didn't condemn it. You agreed with it. You've empowered it. You're hung by your tongue. You got to get to where you start condemning those negative things. And it doesn't mean that you deny that there's a problem in the physical realm. Faith isn't denying that bad things exist. It's just denying that that's all there is to it. It's just denying that the physical natural world is all there is. There's also a spiritual world and who I am in Christ is greater than what I feel in my body. And so I don't deny that I may have a problem, but I deny that that is going to win. I have the same power on the inside of me that raised Christ from the dead and praise God. I start speaking that and I release it. But you have that same power. It's greater than all authority and power and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet. We are the feet of the body of Christ. He is the head. We are the feet. Everything is placed under you. You have authority over the devil, over all devils. There is no devil that you don't have authority over. Man, that's awesome. I, I, I'm trying to restrain myself. He's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you've got everything in Christ. There is no more for heaven to give. You've got it all. You've got Christ. You've got everything that he is. And you didn't get just a baby Christ. You didn't get just a little Christ and you've got to grow into this. Your spirit man's already grown. Your spirit man is complete. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. 1 John 4, 17. Jesus is not a baby. Jesus isn't still growing spiritually. Your spirit man is 100% complete and pure. It's your soul that's growing in its knowledge and understanding and the ability to walk in faith. Your soul is a part of you that is being renewed and that is growing in Christ. But your spirit man is identical to Jesus. If you could understand the things that we're saying right here, it would change the image on the inside of you. And most of us have a self-fulfilling... Well, let me say it differently. All of us have a self-fulfilling prophecy. However you see yourself being is the way that you are. And some of you are thinking, well, man, I'm dying and I never saw myself dying. It's not like I saw this. It's not like I believe for it. But no, you saw yourself as only human. You saw yourself as cancer is bigger than me. And so therefore, cancer is able to dominate you. But you can get to a place to where cancer has no power over me. That's a name. And I've got authority above every name. And you can see yourself in Christ. And again, you don't deny that cancer exists, but you just deny that it has the right to exist in you. You know, this virus that we've been dealing with, and again, I'm not condemning anybody. I know that we're all at different places and stuff, but don't condemn me for believing what the Word says either. But the Bible says no plague will come nigh my dwelling. And I believe, I believe that no plague, no germ can touch my body and live. And I have prayed with hundreds, maybe thousands of people who've been sick and stuff. And I don't get sick. I'm not going to get sick. I don't believe in being sick. It's been decades since I've been sick. And somebody says, I don't believe that. Well, then it won't work for you. But I believe it. I, you know... 